General questions. We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of today. First Minister. Engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This week we mark an auspicious occasion. It is two years since this First Minister took over office, and I congratulate her on doing so. But I wonder if today I could raise a few individual cases that have been sitting in her inbox for much of that time. Uh, firstly, on apprenticeships. This week, the UK Government confirmed the sum that the Scottish Government will get to spend thanks to the new apprenticeship levy. It is £220 million. We said what we would do. We would ring-fence those funds for training and apprenticeships. But we, and most importantly, Scottish employers, still don't know what the Scottish Government would do. Why the delay? First Minister. Uh, there, there is no delay whatsoever. The UK Government decided to introduce the apprenticeship levy without consulting the Scottish Government in any way, shape or form. So we've been waiting to find out their plans. We have, as Ruth Davidson is aware, been consulting uh, with employers and others about how we best use the apprenticeship levy. And of course, the detail of that will be made clear when we publish the budget in a few weeks' time. But two points I think are, are worth making to Ruth Davidson. Firstly, uh, she stood up today and crowed uh, about the fact that the Scottish Government is going to get £221 million. That is indeed true. But it is only two weeks ago since Ruth Davidson was telling us we were actually getting £300 million. Wow. So the amount has reduced since Ruth Davidson last spoke about this issue. But the second point is, I think, more fundamental. Uh, and I think it's important that all members understand this. Uh, while it is important that we use this money and we will use this money to support skills and training and employment in Scotland, this is not additional money. The apprenticeship levy is substituting for money that the UK government was previously using to support apprenticeships. So it's not additional money, it comes through the block grant uh, and it will be replacing money that was previously coming through the block grant. But that said, we will make sure we use this money uh, to support training and skills in Scotland. That's exactly what people would expect us to do. Ruth Davidson. If it's all Westminster's fault, First Minister, why are Scottish trade bodies... Do you want to hear this? Why are Scottish trade bodies accusing you personally of a leadership vacuum on this issue? And why have just this week both the construction industry and the oil and gas industry say they had no idea from you what was going on? Anyway, secondly, on education... Back in 2015... Back in February of 2015... That's 21 months ago. I challenged the First Minister about giving more autonomy to schools. And she replied, and I quote, I'm very happy to discuss the issue with the parents. We were talking specifically about the parents of St Joseph's Primary in Milgai who want to run their own school. Nearly two years on, they're still waiting for an answer. Can I ask again why the delay? First Minister. Firstly, before we do the anyway, let's move on from the first subject she raised. Let me just remind Ruth Davidson, I'm not sure if she was aware of this, that the Scottish Government has carried out and recently concluded a consultation specifically on how we use the apprenticeship levy funds. And we will come forward with the detail of that when we publish the budget in a few weeks' time. But let it not simply be allowed to, to slip away that Ruth Davidson previously claimed £300 million. It's now £221 million, but it is not additional money. It is substitute funds. But let's move on now uh, to education and to St Joseph's. Uh, firstly, again, let's not ignore one important fact that I know Ruth Davidson will not want to share with the Chamber. The reason we've been talking about St Joseph's is that Conservative councillors in that council voted to close St Joseph's. Ruth Davidson's, Ruth Davidson's approach is that Conservative councillors vote to close schools and then she comes and looks to the Scottish Government to clear up their mess. That clearly is Ruth Davidson's approach to politics. But on the specific question of autonomy for schools, Ruth Davidson presumably, although given that she doesn't appear to have been aware of the consultation and apprenticeship levy, I shouldn't take this for granted, presumably she is aware uh, of the consultation underway right now, concludes on January the 6th, into the governance review, where we are specifically 
looking at how we uh, change the balance of responsibility in education to move to a presumption uh, of decisions being taken in schools. And a decision on St Joseph's will be taken in the context of that governance review. That is the right and proper way Absolutely. to do things, not doing what Ruth Davidson is appearing to do today, to turn a blind eye to what her Conservative councillors are doing and then come and ask the Scottish Government to clear up their mess. Yeah. Ruth Davidson. And there's your modern SNP. Need a complaint. Need a complaint on the size of a chocolate bar. They're right on it. Want a decision on a school? Wait two years for a decision on a school. So third, on welfare. Just after the Smith Agreement was signed, again two years ago, the First Minister stood there and demanded of me, of Labour, of the Lib Dems, demanded that Westminster transfer welfare powers as soon as possible. They would be outraged, outraged, if they weren't delivered immediately. Well, those welfare powers are ready to go, but now we learn the SNP aren't anywhere near ready to take them. And they've pleaded, they've pleaded with Westminster to hold on to them for another three years. So they're good at demanding, but they're not very good at governing. So let me ask again, for a third time, on welfare this time, why the delay? First Minister. Well, firstly, again, before uh, Ruth Davidson just gets away with moving on from St Joseph's, let me remind her, there wouldn't be a decision to be taken on St Joseph's if Conservative councillors hadn't voted to close the school. I mean, the hypocrisy of it, yet again this week, is really quite breathtaking. Now, let's turn to welfare. There is no delay on transferring welfare powers. We have to build a system to ensure that we can safely and securely deliver welfare powers. That's what we will do. We will do that on the timetable that we have always said. And when we do have a Scottish Social Security Agency delivering only 15%, but uh, it's better than nothing of welfare, will take better decisions on welfare than the government in London that Ruth Davidson supports. And on on welfare, interestingly, Jean Freeman laid out this in detail uh, to the relevant committee on the 29th of September. Anybody, which I hope is everybody in this chamber, interested in this should go and read the official report. And when she set out the process uh, of doing this, one Adam Tonkins uh, said that he welcomed what she had said. Particularly, he welcomed Jean Freeman's remarks about not using this issue as a political football. Perhaps Ruth Davidson should listen to Adam Tonkins once in a while. Ruth Davidson. The timetable we've always said. Read the official report. All right, First Minister, I will read the official report. The official report, November 27, 2014, Nicola Sturgeon. I say genuinely to all parties, as a parliament, ask the Westminster government to transfer the powers as soon as possible. Today's official report, massive screeching U-turn. Wait three more years. So here's the First Minister's record. On apprenticeships, no clear plan to tell employers. On education reform, wait and see. On welfare, a three-year delay. On Frank's law, clear as mud. On NHS reform, coming soon. An investment deal with China, a Scottish shambles. Decision on fracking, we'll get back to you. The SNP, dithering, not delivering. And two years ago, presiding officer, two years ago, when this First Minister accepted the role bestowed on her by this Parliament as First Minister for all of Scotland, she stood up and she said, I intend to lead a government with purpose, a government that is bold, that is imaginative, that is adventurous. First Minister, what happened? Yeah. But I think the, only, the only real question that has to be asked about today's First Minister's question so far is how many own goals is Ruth Davidson <laughs> going to score? She's just stood up, and I think this is a direct quote. She's just stood up and accused me on, I think, the apprenticeship levy wrongly of having no clear plan. Imagine a Tory having the nerve to get up and accuse anybody right now of having no clear plan. That sums up the entirety of Theresa May's government right now. Uh, on welfare, what Ruth Davidson apparently appears to be saying 
is that we should take responsibility for delivering disability benefits, carers allowance uh, and other important benefits before we have the system in place to actually ensure that these benefits can be put into people's hands or bank accounts. Uh, she may want to act irresponsibly uh, in that respect, but I'm going to act responsibly so that we can have in Scotland, uh, not for the entirety of welfare, unfortunately, uh, but for those benefits that are going to be devolved, we can have a fair, humane and dignified welfare system. And how much of a difference will that be to the one that's been presided over by the Conservatives in London right now? Question number two, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the First Minister when she'll next meet the Auditor General for Scotland. First Minister. I have no current plans, but the Permanent Secretary meets the Auditor General on a regular basis and the Cabinet Secretary for Finance last met with the Auditor General on the 30th of August. Kezia Dugdale. This morning, Scotland's rail network was thrown into chaos. A broken down train disrupted the travel plans for tens of thousands of commuters across the central belt. It has been yet another shambolic day, causing misery for passengers. The Transport Minister, Hamza Youssef, who crosses the country in his ministerial car, took to Twitter this morning to admit, to admit the ScotRail performance is not good enough. Does the First Minister really understand just how angry Scotland's commuters are today? First Minister. Yes, I, I do. Uh, I and indeed Hamza Youssef took part in a conference call with ScotRail earlier this morning. Um, I know they are extremely sorry for the disruption that passengers have experienced this morning and I share that sentiment. Uh, the problem this morning, as Kezia Dugdale has alluded to, was caused by a train breaking down between Waverley and Haymarket Station just at Princes Street Gardens. Uh, all the lines into Edinburgh were blocked by the train that had broken down. Scott Reel described it to me this morning as probably the worst location in the country for a breakdown like this to happen because there was no other ways for the trains to get into Waverley Station. Uh, the train was uh, removed at around 8.30 this morning. There has been a restricted train service uh, running on many routes uh, since then while the network returned to normal. Uh, I'm advised by ScotRail, was advised by ScotRail just before I came into the chamber uh, that the service uh, is more or less returned to normal right now. Uh, it, has, it has caused significant disruption. Now, what I would say, and say this seriously, is there are wider performance issues around ScotRail right now. We've discussed them in this chamber before. That's why there is in place an improvement plan that Hamza Yousaf is monitoring very closely. But I hope all members uh, would accept that however regrettable it is, and it is deeply regrettable, on occasion trains will break down whatever party is in government. The priority when that happens is to get services back to normal as quickly as possible. And that is what ScotRail has been focused on this morning. Kezia Dugdale. Thank you, President Officer. Look, I can accept, we can accept that today's disruption might be a one-off. But yesterday was considered just a normal day on Scotland's rail network. And you can bet there are wider performance issues, First Minister. Scottish Labour can reveal the performance figure for yesterday was 79%. That means that on a normal day, more than one in five trains failed to arrive on time. In rural areas, Yesterday's performance figure was 60%. That's against a target of 91%. It's not even close, First Minister. Passengers deserve better, and it is this government's responsibility to fix it. When I challenged the First Minister on this six weeks ago, she said the government had an improvement plan. Hamza Yousaf said he had confidence in that improvement plan. Well, passengers are fast losing confidence in him. How bad does it have to get before the First Minister steps in and sorts out this mess? First Minister. Well, firstly, the government does accept our responsibility in this matter, uh, and we are working with ScotRail to make sure that train services are of a standard that the travelling public has a right to expect. And I repeat the apology uh, that ScotRail uh, have expressed for the disruption this morning, which was caused by an extraordinary uh, set of circumstances. In terms of the wider issues, as I have said in this chamber before, the standard that ScotRail uh, is expected to meet is 91% against uh, 
punctuality standards. Uh, that uh, generally at the moment is about 89%, although as Kezia Dugdale has just narrated, uh, there will be variations to that. That is not good enough. That is why the improvement plan is in place. That is why Hamza Yousaf continues to work with ScotRail to improve it. Just uh, this week, uh, we, we heard plans about additional trains coming into services uh, to, to service, about uh, ScotRail rightly uh, ceasing the practice at peak hour time of, of missing stops where trains are running late. So these are serious issues that affect the travelling public on a daily basis and we are absolutely determined uh, to make sure that we work with ScotRail to rectify them. Uh, on a wider uh, sense, as I again have said in this chamber previously, uh, there are options for the contract to be broken early and we will keep that option under review. Uh, thanks to pressure of this government, in future we will also have the option of, of having a public sector uh, organisation bid for the rail franchise and I think that is a step forward after Labour for 13 years in government refusing to get give us the power to do that. So these are serious issues. I take uh, my responsibility and the government's responsibility seriously to make sure we get on top of these issues. Uh, as I've said, we will. We've had an apology from ScotRail, President Officer, but I think commuters would like to hear an apology from the First Minister. And real, pass real passengers don't feel like they've seen any sort of improvement over that six-week period. Last week, ScotRail cancelled trains because it expected the rails to be slippery due to excessive moisture. <laughs> Rain in Scotland, presiding officer. Who could have predicted that? <laughs> but for Scotland's rail passengers, this isn't a laughing matter anymore. Overcrowded trains, delayed trains, cancelled trains. That's the SNP's idea of a world leading deal for passengers. Isn't it clear, more than ever, that Labour's policy for a people's ScotRail run for passengers, not for profit, is the best solution for Scotland. First Minister. Well, firstly, people uh, watching this will have heard me say that I am sorry for the disruption that was caused this morning um, and also sorry for the disruption that any passenger faces on any day of the week. That's ScotRail's position and it is also mine. Uh, in terms of uh, the, some of the decisions that Kezia Dugdale alluded to there, ScotRail have a responsibility to ensure the safe running of trains. And it's easy to make jokes about moisture, but they have that responsibility and it's important that they discharge that responsibility. In terms of the wider issues, I absolutely accept uh, that things are not good enough. That is why the improvement plan is in place and that is why we will stick with that until things are uh, running to a standard that the public have a right to expect. But on the wider issue of a people's railway, uh, let me point out again uh, the, the reason it was not possible for a public sector organisation to bid for the rail franchise when Abellio bid and won that contract uh, was that we didn't have the power to do that. Um, and we had asked uh, the previous Labour government at Westminster to change the law or to give us the power to change the law here and they refused point blank to do that. Kezia Dugdale can shake her head, but that, I'm afraid, is the reality of the situation. Now we do have that power, we are going to have that power, and we've made clear that by the time this contract comes up for renewal, whether that's on schedule or early, uh, there will be the ability of a public sector organisation to bid for it. That's the progress we've made, progress that was impeded for Labour, uh, by Labour for a long, long time. Two constituency questions. The first from Sandra White. Thank, thank you, President Officer. Uh, the First Minister will aware of the announcement by Shell to close its finance operations at Boswell Street in Glasgow in my constituency with the loss of 380 jobs. Uh, I've phoned up uh, Shell and I've asked to have a meeting as urgently as possible. Can I therefore ask the First Minister what support the Scottish Government could give to these 380 workers at this very difficult time? First Minister. Well, I'm very disappointed, was very disappointed yesterday to learn of the closure of Shell's finance operations office in Glasgow. I know this will be a difficult time for the employees affected, uh, for the families and indeed for uh, Glasgow as a whole. Scottish Enterprise are engaging with Shell to offer their full support. Uh, the Scottish Government's PACE initiative stands ready to help those affected through providing skills development and employability support. Uh, and the transition training fund, which we set up uh, specifically to help respond to the downturn in oil and gas is available to support individuals who wish to retrain and secure new opportunities in the oil and gas or wider energy and manufacturing sectors. Uh, Sandra White uh, has said that she has sought a meeting with Shell. Uh, the Economy Minister would also be happy to meet with her and keep her uh, updated on developments in this case. 
Jamie Green. Uh, Mr. Randall is 78 years of age and lives on the Isle of Arran. He was diagnosed this year with a heart condition in May of this year. He received a letter saying that the next available consultation to see a cardiac consultant is in December 2017. And unfortunately, that was not a typo. He wrote to the health minister to complain about the waiting time, who said that while she could not intervene on the case, it was not because, I quote, we are uninterested. What does the First Minister have to say to people like Mr Randall, who have to wait up to 19 months to see a consultant, because I am very interested? First Minister. Uh, well, not, not, not surprisingly so am I. I am very happy to look into the particular circumstances of that case. I, I, I don't say that to avoid answering it in the chamber, but it is important in these cases that we get the opportunity to look at the details. I, there was a case raised by Anas Sarwar last week that on the face of it appeared to be completely unacceptable, but then when we looked into it, it turned out to have uh, very particular circumstances attached to it. I'm not saying that's the case uh, in this situation, but I will look into that and the Health Secretary will uh, liaise uh, with the member once we've had the opportunity to do so. But on the face of it is a completely unacceptable waiting time uh, and one that I would expect the Health Board to rectify. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. To, uh, to ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. First Minister. Uh, Tuesday. Mr Harvey. Around the world, the vast majority of developed countries and health organisations recognise that access to safe, legal abortion is absolutely critically important to a great many women's health. And where that's not available, women's lives and women's health always suffer. And yet within the UK, tragically, there are women who don't have access to this important right. Many women in Northern Ireland find themselves left with no option but to travel uh, elsewhere in the UK to access legal and safe abortion. The time and the stress that this costs them is bad enough, but there are also significant financial barriers, with some organisations supporting these women estimating that at the low end it costs at least £400 and in many other cases more than £2,000. Uh, does the First Minister agree that the NHS in Scotland should be exploring what can be done to ensure that these women are able to access abortion in Scotland if that's where they choose to travel to without facing these kind of uh, unacceptable financial barriers? First Minister. Um, I'm very happy to explore that with the NHS, to explore both uh, what the situation would be right now in terms of uh, accessing safe and legal abortion uh, for women from Northern Ireland uh, within NHS Scotland and whether there's any uh, improvements that uh, are able to be made. Um, I believe, like Patrick Harvey, that women should have the right to choose uh, within the limits that we currently uh, set down in law and I believe that right should be defended. And when a woman, any woman, does uh, opt to have an abortion, uh, and let's stress that that is never, ever an easy decision for any woman, uh, then abortion should be available in a safe uh, and legal way. Uh, so that is my view on the matter. Uh, Patrick Harvey has asked me to explore a particular issue around NHS Scotland, and I'm happy to do so. Patrick Harvey. I'm grateful for that answer, and I look forward to, to hearing an update once uh, that, uh, that issue has been explored. Does the First Minister agree with me that abortion should be regarded as a part of the normal range of health care provided and should not be stigmatised or treated as something exceptional? In that context, is there any other part of the, the normal range of health care provision uh, where the NHS in Scotland would turn people away simply because of where they happen to live if they're in Scotland and seeking to access uh, that service? Should we not regard abortion as a normal part of the range of health care rather than stigmatising it? First Minister. Well, I, I certainly agree that uh, no woman, woman should be ever stigmatised for having an abortion. No woman ever wants to have an abortion. There will be a variety of circumstances in which a woman will find herself in that uh, position and I absolutely agree that safe uh, abortion is of paramount importance uh, and I also agree that abortion should never be seen in isolation it is a, a part of health care um, and delivering abortion safely uh, is, is a, a fundamental uh, part uh, of, of health care uh, as I say I'm happy to go away and explore the particular issues about how NHS Scotland would deal with women coming from other parts of the UK and uh, write to Patrick Harvey whenever the opportunity to do so. Question number four, Willie Rennie. To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, matters of importance to the people of Scotland. Willie Rennie. 
During the election campaign just a few months ago, the First Minister agreed with me that big changes were required in mental health services. Now, leading health campaigners have serious concerns about the new draft strategy. Children in Scotland say there is widespread concern the proposals are too narrow in their focus. The Royal College of Nursing say the strategy is not aspirational. The psychiatrists say it does not amount to transformation. And support in mind say it is neither visionary nor ambitious. Does the First Minister accept that the draft strategy is just not good enough? First Minister. Uh, no, I don't accept that, but it is a draft strategy. Uh, and if there are views uh, from organisations such as those or very respected organisations that Willie Rennie uh, has cited here today, then these are views we should take seriously and we should work with these organisations uh, to make uh, such improvements as they think should be made. And I give an undertaking today that we will do that. I, I do think we have, you know, despite the disagreements we have on, indeed on this and on a range of other issues, I do think we have managed uh, to obtain and achieve a degree of consensus across this chamber about the importance of mental health and about the importance of improving mental health treatment, prevention and care in this country. And uh, the government is serious about doing that. The mental health strategy is an important part of doing that. Uh, and we will work with organisations uh, on the basis of the draft strategy to look at ways in which we can strengthen it further. Will you any? The First Minister says that there's a degree of consensus. There will never be consensus when you get health organisations like that saying the things that they did. The signs are not good enough. The government failed to renew the mental health strategy on time, but it has not been one for almost a year. And now these health campaigners are unhappy. If you look at the use of mental health drugs, it's reached a 10-year high. New figures show that almost 1 million prescriptions were issued last year, which is up 50%. And a majority of health boards don't meet the 18-week target for non-drug psychological therapies. The government has let the strategy lapse. The use of drugs is up. The alternatives are not available for everyone. Charities say there is not a community focus. This is a serious set of concerns. What chance has the government got of getting the services right if they can't even get the strategy right? So I ask her this. What will she do differently to meet those aspirations that she set out during the election campaign just a few months ago. First Minister. Look, I, I agree with Willie Rennie that there is a great deal of improvement that we need to make around mental health services. Scotland is not unique in this. Some of uh, what he uh, narrates here today, take the increase in drug prescriptions, for example, that is true. It is partly down to the fact that more people are coming forward uh, with mental health uh, difficulties. And, you know, while that puts a, a responsibility in us to make sure the services are there, we should welcome the fact that the stigma is reducing and more people are coming forward. It's also why we are seeing pressure uh, on waiting times, although waiting times for CAMS are improving, but there is uh, significant work still to be done. The Mental Welfare Committee Commission uh, published a report just this week, in fact, where, yes, there is work to do, but it welcomed the sharp reduction in the numbers of children being treated for mental health in non-specialist wards. Uh, so there is progress being made, but I readily accept that there is much work still to do. Now, turning to the strategy, we publish strategies in draft form for a reason, because we want to engage with the experts on the front line uh, so that we can strengthen those strategies uh, and publish the final strategy in as good a shape as, as we possibly can. It's not unusual for organisations at the draft stage of any strategy to push us to go further. That's why we publish and draft and it's why we engage with these organisations. We will do that and indeed if Willie Rennie uh, wants to submit specific suggestions for how we could change uh, the draft strategy, we're very happy to listen to those suggestions from him or from anyone else. Kate Forbes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Tory backbenchers at Westminster have supported SNP calls to halt cuts to employment and support allowance and universal credit. Will the First Minister join me in extending an open invitation to reasonable Tories in this chamber who recognise the worrying impact of these cuts and wish to add their voices to demands for the Chancellor to postpone changes until alternative support for sick and disabled people is in place? First Minister. Okay, well, I was sort of struggling with the term reasonable Tories uh, in this chamber, but once uh, I got over that, this is a, a really uh, serious issue. Uh, the autumn statement is next week. Uh, the cuts to ESA uh, will impact 
on many, many people. And I uh, hope the, the, the new Prime Minister has said that she is anxious to help people uh, who are just managing. Uh, well, uh, you know, this group of people that we're talking about in many respects are not even just managing. Uh, so I would hope that the Chancellor will suspend uh, these changes uh, and I hope that he hears the views of this Parliament when he's making the decisions on the autumn statement. Claire Baker. Thank you, President Officer. I know that the First Minister takes the issue of domestic abuse very seriously and that she would welcome the positive work that has been done by Police Scotland and the Procurator Fiscal in recent years in taking forward tackling the crime. Will she then agree with me that the way in which Callum Steele of the Scottish Police Federation has expressed his concerns, describing court cases as a rigmarole and a charade and saying that the police hoover up everything in the hope that we miss nothing, is deeply unhelpful and risks undermining the progress that is being made? And will she join me in supporting the approach that is being followed, which has resulted in a conviction rate for domestic abuse that is upwards of 80%? First Minister. Uh, yes, I, I agree with that. I mean, of course, uh, police officers must have discretion when they're called to any incidents in terms of the action they take. Uh, but I do believe we should have a zero tolerance approach to domestic abuse. And I think the police and indeed the Crown Office are to be commended uh, for the fact that more perpetrators of domestic abuse are being perpetrated, uh, are being brought to justice uh, and convicted. And I think that's something we should all welcome. We are investing uh, more resources in tackling domestic abuse. We're uh, about as a parliament to look at new legislation around domestic abuse. Uh, and I think it's really important that a united message uh, goes from this parliament that domestic abuse is never ever acceptable and it should always be treated with the utmost seriousness. Liam MacArthur. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. In 2011, this government uh, took the decision to remove business-related travel from uh, air discount scheme support. Uh, this decision, taken without any prior consultation, pushed up transport costs for businesses and the public sector in our islands, including in Orkney. High Trans have now made a compelling case for reversing this decision and allowing island businesses to compete on a more level playing field. Does the First Minister accept that case and will she agree to overturn this earlier wrong-headed decision? First Minister. Uh, I am very happy uh, to ask the Transport uh, Minister to look at the case that's been put forward by High Trans uh, and to correspond with the member. Of course, we want our islands to be as accessible uh, as possible uh, for business travellers uh, as well as for others. So uh, we will look at the case that High Trans uh, has put forward and the Transport Minister will respond in due course. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the recent survey by Nielsen indicating that 69% of spirits sold in Scotland fall below a minim minimum unit price of 50 pence. First Minister. Well, one of the reasons we have pursued a policy of minimum <coughs> unit pricing is that we've been well aware for some time how much alcohol is sold very cheaply relative to its strength. Minimum unit pricing is precisely designed to target uh, that issue. Very cheap, very high strength alcohol does real damage to individuals and to our communities. And that's why I look forward to the implementation of this life-saving policy as soon as possible. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the First Minister for that answer. M minimum unit pricing is clearly the most effective and proportionate way to reduce the harm caused by cheap, high strength alcohol. Now that the Court of Session has ruled in favour of the Scottish Government, following the Scottish Whisky Association's legal action on the issue, and assuming there is no appeal by tomorrow's deadline, can the First Minister advise the Chamber when she envisages this policy being delivered as agreed by this Parliament? First Minister. Uh, well, Kenny Gibson correctly identifies that the, the main, the only stumbling block to minimum unit pricing now being introduced is whether or not the Scotch Whiskey Association and their co-litigants in this case uh, seek leave to appeal to the Supreme Court. As Kenny Gibson says, the deadline for that application is tomorrow, although I think uh, it's important to say that even if such an application seeking leave to appeal uh, was uh, put forward, that doesn't make it inevitable that appeal will proceed all of the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, but the SWA can still now, even at this late stage, choose not uh, to apply for leave to appeal. And I hope very much that that's the course of action uh, they choose to take. Uh, I hope that they and others will reflect that minimum unit pricing was passed with the overwhelming support of this parliament. It has been tested in Europe. It has now been approved twice in the Scottish courts. Uh, and I think industry itself would receive widespread and very justified approval and respect if it accepts that the time has now come to implement this measure, a measure that will save lives across Scotland. 
Question number six, Annie Wales. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to tackle cyberbullying. First Minister. Well, as we mark anti-bullying week, I want to make clear that all types of bullying are unacceptable, no matter uh, where the bullying takes place. We need to protect young people from harm and ensure that practitioners have the skills to prevent and respond to online and offline bullying. Uh, we already have an internet safety action plan and work is underway to update it. The refresh plan will recognise the impact of online bullying and how it can be addressed and prevented both in schools and at home. At the same time, Respect Me, Scotland's anti-bullying service, continues to provide advice and training on bullying and internet safety for local authorities, parents and carers, and all those working with children and young people. Annie Wells. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Can I ask Police Scotland to play a front-line role in reporting of cybercrime? What specific conversations has the Scottish Government had with the police in their dealing with this issue? First Minister. Uh, well, the, the Scottish Government will have uh, discussions on a whole range of uh, matters uh, with Police Scotland. I'm happy to uh, write to the member to set out uh, any interactions we've had with Police Scotland specifically on the issue of cyberbullying. Of course, with cybercrime, as with any other crime, it is down to the discretion of the police uh, how they investigate uh, and take forward uh, allegations of criminal activity and, of course, then down to the Crown Office in terms of uh, what crime is uh, prosecuted. Uh, but there is absolutely no doubt that cybercrime is uh, an important issue. It's an issue that is increasing and one that we all have to take seriously. I know the Equalities and Human Rights Committee of this Parliament has shown a great interest in the refresh strategy that the Scottish Government is working on uh, and we look forward to working with them and others to make sure we have the right policies in place uh, to tackle this growing problem. Julian Martin. Tony Chancellor Philip Hammond is expected to reveal a 100 billion Brexit hole in his budget. What representations has the Scottish Government made right. to ensure Scotland's finances are protected and we do not pay the price for the Tories' Brexit mess? Uh, First Minister, we, we, we won't take that question if you don't mind. It's, uh, just remind members, uh, supplementaries have to be on the same topic of, outlined in the written question. Uh, question number seven, Donald Cameron. <coughs> to ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to ensure that people with diabetes receive regular monitoring of their condition. First Minister. Well, this week marked World Diabetes Day, which reminds all of us of the need to ensure that everyone living with diabetes receives vital health care checks. These checks are essential in reducing the risks of complications from diabetes. New quarterly monitoring processes were introduced at the start of this year as part of our diabetes improvement plan. This monitoring ensures that we continue to increase the number of people who have regular checks, including blood sugar levels, weight, uh, foot ulceration and diabetic retinopathy screening. Donald Cameron. Two years ago, the Scottish Government released its Diabetes Improvement Plan, which stated that monitoring diabetes was a clear objective. However, the First Minister may be aware that the recently published NHS Scottish Diabetes Survey highlighted that in 2015, fewer than 40% of type 1 diabetes patients received the full number of checkups, and around half of people with type 2 didn't receive the full number of checkups. Will she accept that two years on, the Scottish Government's current strategy? on monitoring diabetes just is not working. First Minister. Uh, no, I, I don't accept that. As I said in my original answer, the quarterly monitoring processes were introduced at the start of, of this year. That was part of the diabetes improvement plan. Um, and what the quarterly monitoring uh, does is look at measures specifically amongst other things for the number of people receiving the nine care processes and also receiving structured education. Uh, the member of course is right to underline the importance of people getting all the checks that they should be getting and that's why this uh, monitoring has been introduced to make sure uh, that we ensure that that is the case. Of course there's other important actions we're taking around diabetes, uh, for example increasing access to insulin pumps. So we'll continue to take all of that action to try to prevent diabetes and make sure that people uh, with that have access to good services and in particular services that reduce their risk of complications. Thank you. That concludes uh, First Minister's questions. We'll now move to members' business and I would ask uh, members to take a few minutes to change seats. I'll go ahead and see.